Antes que nada, les recuerdo que hay dos salidas de emergencia, una de su lado derecho y una de su lado izquierdo. También les sugerimos el uso de cubrebocas, por favor, y de no ser así, que se siente en un espacio eh, distante de otro. El día de hoy eh, tenemos el gusto, ah, perdón, y sus celulares, favor de ponerlos en modo eh, sil en silencio, por favor. Eh, el día de hoy nos acompaña el maestro Sócrates Lentana, él es investigador y estudiante de posgrado, eh, centrado en la sistemática, biogeografía y evolución de los noscardones, eh, o estride, con fuertes intereses en taxonomía, ecología, parasitismo de moscas verdaderas, diptera, y otros artrópodos, junto con la biodiversidad tropical. Al respecto, él tiene ya cinco publicaciones relevantes del tema. Actualmente, él está realizando sus estudios de doctorado en el Bohar Museum of Entomology en la Universidad de California y el Museo de Historia Natural de Dinamarca en Copenhague, en donde está utilizando conocimientos, métodos y herramientas filogenéticas actuales para descifrar y comprender las especies. Límite, límites, filogenia y biografía de las moscas de la familia Os, Oestride en el espacio huésped global de eh, los mamíferos. También ha sido revisor eh, de cinco revistas científicas, en una de las más destacadas es OKIS, y acreedor a diferentes premios y financiamientos. Uno muy relevante es el Samuel Winston Dipteral Research Fund del eh, Museo Smithsoniano. En la Universidad de Filipinas eh, ha impartido clases eh, de ecología, entomología, biodiversidad, biología de campo y también ha sido asesor de estudiantes eh, de licenciatura en esa universidad. Entonces, sin más, le agradecemos a Sócrates su presencia. Uh, buenos días. Thank you for, uh, for the introduction, Omar. Uh, so I'm going to uh, give this talk in English. And I'll try to explain it uh, and break it down a little uh, and, and slowly as much as I can. So this topic is part of my research project working on bot flies, our SUD family. SUD belongs to the uh, order Diptera. So they're characterized by you know, having pairs of two wings and a, and a modified hind wings of faltiers. This group of flies are rarely, in the, rarely collected and very rare in the collection and hence my research benefited a lot from the museum collections. Um, I'm going to break this down, this talk about the parasites um, into three topics. First, I uh, such a quick overview of diptera, true flies and their classification and updates. And uh, well, the second one is about the new world bot flies of the bot flies of the Americas meaning from North, Central, and South America. I'm going to give a talk, the unique group of bot flies from there. And then the third one is about a, a, a new find that I, I, I recently discovered from visiting a museum in Smithsonian, uh, run the association of bot flies and parasitic uh, flatworms. This talk I gave uh, last uh, July from the International Congress of Dipterology. So I tried to condense it in a more uh, digestible, palatable way. So. True flies, just a quick overview. Uh, there are about 160 families. It's a, uh, one of the biggest hollow metabolites or com with complete metamorphosis insects, together with um, Lepidoptera, you know, butterflies and moths, Hymenoptera, bees and ants, Coleoptera, the beetles, who are currently the, one of the biggest order, and then um, um, Coleoptera, Hymenoptera, Diptera, uh, and then the uh, Lepidoptera, moths and butterflies, one of the biggest. The size range um, from the mydid flies to one of the forward flies are the smallest so far we've known about flies. And there could be about a million species or uh, uh, approximately uh, you know, the estimation of flies. And here in the Arctic region, some of the endemic group of uh, flies that we have is the uh, pistomyid. Uh, these are pretty unique in the southern part of California, Oreoleptidae. Uh, these are found also in the eastern side of the US. In the neotropical, some of the endemic uh, families that we found, I think we, you've seen some of this, uh, Pantothalmid, Evocoidi, uh, they are found in Chile, so far, and, and the Somatiidi uh, from Central America probably extend to uh, southern part of Mexico up to 
uh, um, Brazil. And then, and then uh, Saringo Gastrit is an acalyptrate fly from Mexico. Um, I've tried to look in the collection I haven't seen so far, but it's recorded here in, um, in Mexico, one of the endemic uh, group of flies. So um, once it, would, uh, it, it can be arguably said that um, diptera, true flies, are the most ecologically diverse group of insects, you'll find them from any types of habitat. And they have different or very varied ways of lifestyle from herbivory up to parasitism, you name it, you'll find them from the forest floor, streams, uh, canopies, even some extreme conditions in term, there are some thermophiles, even in some petroleum. There are cases of uh, um, uh, flies that are found in, uh, that they can leave in, in oil. Uh, there are some ephydriids. But here I mentioned if, um, herbivores, some uh, blood feeders, decomposers, predators, parasites, even pollinators of insects. So this is a very good uh, group of study, whether you study ecology or evolutionary history. So I mentioned um, some gall midges. Those are a good example. Some uh, uh, important pests around the world are flies. Um, decomposers, some fungus gnats associated in uh, spreading the spores of fungi. Uh, a lot of flies are involved. Also pollinators, good mimics of bumblebees, bees and wasps. Uh, this is a bumblebee. Uh, there are parasitoids. The larvae are parasitoids. The larvae of cirphids are predators of aphids. So it's a win-win for agriculture. You can use that as a biocontrol and at the same time as a pollinator. So um, some of them, a lot of um, flies are also parasitic. You know, uh, they feed on blood and, and they uh, ex um, really utilize or ex uh, exploit their resources, whether from uh, lymphatic fluids or blood from mammals. So parasitism, based on the phylogenetic tree done by Wigman back in 2011, evolved around multiple times, at least 37 or 39 times. But the uniqueness of this is I'm going to talk more about on this clade, the calyptrate flies, where the bot flies belong. The uniqueness of bot flies is that they specialize only in mammals. This a lineage of bot flies that only specialize on mammals. So if we're going to look, you know, uh, like the groupings of bot flies based on morphology, you can separate them in several uh, groupings, whether from Brachycera, Arinumera, Cyclorapha, um, Schizophora, or Calyptrate, based on these characters that can separate them easily. But it doesn't always be the case. Um, from different data, whether more, um, molecular, morphological, or even a consensus tree, there are some sort of like um, conflicts. But here, I'm going to just show you here that the bot flies belong to the calyptrate flies. Okay. And then this is the clade where the bot flies belong. So calyptrate flies can be recognized by the base of the wing. They have, when they fold their wings, they have this what we call calyptors, hence the name calyptrate. We have this the upper and the lower calyptrates. So you'll probably encounter them most of the time. You're having, um, you know, uh, bat flies, house flies, blow flies, even flesh flies. Those are calyptrate flies. So, you know, several characters used to, uh, are synapomorphic characters that kind of define this group, whether from the wings or the sutures on the thorax, or sometimes the haltiers that moves independently or oscillate while walking, and then the mouth part. Uh, this is pretty unique for some of the house flies. So the mouth part that goes down is what you see from here. Those are the um, structure that kind of unique for the house flies and the calyptrate flies. So basically, they are uh, grouped into three, the calyptrate flies and uh, three superfamilies, Estroidea, Muscoidea, and Hippoboscoidea. They are traditional groupings. But recent studies suggest that Muscoidea seems to be more of like a grade so there's some sort of rearrangement going on, whether in the phylogeny and some interpretation for the classification. So probably in the coming years, you'll be, you'll be encountering a lot of changes in the names based on recent studies. So there are some proposals I see here that the scatophages and antimide, if you're some familiar with them, there are two distinct families that are now proposing to be one and propose erect a, a super family, antimidoea, and then muscoidea, phanoidea, and then muscoidea. But these are some of the, you know, expect some changes going on from here. But we're going to focus here on the superfamily of Stroidea. The uh, characters, you know, for flies, we study hairs, plates, 
whether there are hairs or not in a certain place or whether certain veins are folded or angled in such um, manner or not. This will give you some structure or oh, some, some idea on how to separate them clearly. And these are the members or the, or the families belong to the super family, the blowflies. Mesembrinella, this is neotropical. We have it here in Mexico, also extend up to um, um, uh, southern part of Brazil or to northern part of Argentina. This Tassinobid is a monotypic. There's only one species belonging to this New Zealand bat fly. It's only found in New Zealand. Uh, S3D, that's going, what I'm going to talk about. Polynidae, most of them are parasites of earthworms. Sarcophagia is a huge family, the flesh flies, very big ones. They are gray with three stripes. The kinids are all parasitic. They are parasites of most of the uh, insects. And then Ulurumaidi, this is recently described family from Australia. So there are uh, a lot of development, you know, going on for the Australia. But botflies, let's go back to let's go back to botflies. This is one I'm going to talk about. They are pretty unique. They have spines. The larvae are parasites of mammals, and the adults are free living. So there are either three types you can classify botflies the larvae based on their location of their parasitism, whether they're found inside a stomach, under the skin, or in the cephalopharyngeal, uh, uh, sorry, uh, um, the nasal part inside the nose or the sinus. So the botflies that are clearly um, based on larval morphology are four subfamilies. The skin, New World skin botflies, the terebrini gastrophilin, the stomach botflies, Hypodermatidine, the old world um, skin ball flies, and the estrogenidine, the nasal ball flies. Okay, so these are examples of the adults. There are good mimics of bumblebees, so you can easily mistake them as bumblebees or even some uh, honeybees or sometimes honeybees. But these are examples of good mimics. Some of them, this is the reindeer ball, uh, reindeer ball fly found in the um, polyarctic region. Okay, these are the neotropical, the human botfly, probably you've heard about this, the, the Dermatobia hominis, and this is the cuterebrin you'll find, you'll find usually in the New World, and this is an elephant botflies. So again, the range of hosts of, of botflies are from the mice after the largest mammals, rhinos, elephants, kangaroos, moose, you name it, they are there. And this one is a pika, if you're familiar with Pikachu, it's one of the Pokemon. The pika the animal, these are the, 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 the uh, parasite botflies. They're only found in Central Asia. So there are several changes here. So the main takeaway from this is that botflies have been, um, have been an elusive, whether which is the sister family, sister uh, of, of the botflies. From A to B, they use morphology and then the different placement. Uh, is still uh, unclear. And uh, from C, D, E, G, H, they use combined nuclear and mitochondrial uh, data. And then the F, they use uh, mitogenomics. And the more recent one is uh, by Eliana, Eliana Beneventura. They use, she used, and, and her colleagues use uh, ultra-conserved elements. And it suggests that the botflies are paraphyletic with sarcophagus. Uh, still, still unresolved, but somehow we're going to. Uh, it, it leads towards that. It suggests that botflies are mostly cl closely related to flesh flies, the sarcophagus. So, and and what's even surprising is that it even suggests that botflies are polyphyletic, which is to me it's really it's it's really a puzzle. It's surprising. Uh, they uh, here, uh, Jan et al. use a transcript transcriptomic data. So it's still a, it's still a, it's still a you know a question big question. So what how are they really related? But they're uh, they're still going to uh, this is still going to under a peer review and we'll see how it goes. Uh, recent study. So going back to the different four uh, subfamilies. So we're going to focus here. These are the New World bot flies. They're only found here in the in, in the New World, and some uh, I guess uh, uh, examples here as a dermatobia. How many is I gave this example? Another one is found usually in the eastern side of, of US, uh, the um, Fontinella, the tribe of Fontinella, they call it squirrel bot fly because uh, they usually parasitize the squirrels. They are really uh, nasty and, and you know poor um, squirrels. Yeah. And we have this, this is only the only species of bot fly that parasitizes primates, the howler monkeys. 
the Pereira BRI, this is so far that we know of. There are only uh, there are only the parasitic butterflies that infest howler monkeys, just on the neck or on the neck. It's pretty unique. And this one is from Arizona. We think this is a rodent butterfly from pack rats. Uh, this one is from also new uh, from Arizona, New Mexico. It's a rabbit butterfly. But it's, you can see the different colors and pa patterns going back here. See, there's a whitish, like an ash pattern on the abdomen and the legs, and sometimes on the head. And here from the rabbit butterflies, you can see a red streak, a red on the legs. It's pretty distinct. Okay. But the, the gestalt is pretty the same. This one is we don't know what species this is. This is from Costa Rica. We don't know the host yet. But see, there are a lot of hairs covered with like a carpet of hairs with yellow, orange, red, and then black. But that kind of resembles bumblebees. So the second topic that I'm going to talk is about how many actually genera are there in the subfamily of Cuterebrine? That's the main question because this is the biggest radiation of bot flies. So uh, parasitic uh, insects, particularly for flies, it's pretty unique because morphologically constrained in locating both their host or even their mate. So they are kind of specialized and constrained in looking on, on using their sensory structures, whether the eyes, antennae, and legs, where the most of the sensilla are, are located. So the, the neural ball flies are here. These are not donuts, just as, just as a face, okay, the frontal view. So the variation on the calluses, the white patterns, and even the shape of the antenna are pretty unique. So again, going back here, the neural ball flies, this is not, uh, the deer ball fly is also located in the North America, Central America region. We found they extend up to Costa Rica and probably Panama. So, but we're going just to focus here, the dermatoia, two genera that has been proposed. And uh, we, they thought that based on the a study done by uh, Seretti et al, that the age of SGD is about three, 30 million years ago, using uh, two representatives of, uh, well, from one from Kitarab and one from a deer ball fly. If that's the case, we can probably hypothesize that the ball flies especially kind of um, um, evolve around this time in the winter period, even before the North America and South America closed. So it, it might suggest that also that the ball fly evolved from North America and so to going to South America. That's the probably or hypothesis we can derive from that paper. And this is so far the only um, fossil that we know of uh, it's a piparium from uh, Arizona. From uh, This is um, a raw scan of that um, uh, uh, um, rodent bot fly. It's pretty young, so we might treat it as well as a, probably an you know, extant species. But we're, we're, what, what we are trying to still resolve it. But so far, we are def definite that this is a cuterebra bot fly based on the structure of the spiracles and some of the mouth hooks. So... Um, there are several proposals, several genera. You know, Dermatobia cuterebra, I mentioned a bit about this, but there are several, if you go back to the literature, there are also Metacuterebra, Pseudogamitis, Andinocuterebra, and Rogenhofer that has been uh, uh, adopted in some uh, other uh, uh, taxonomists. So again, that's why I raised the question of how many genera are there really? So going back, so I looked at the, there's only one species of Cuterebra and then about 70 species of Cuterebra in the broad sense. I included there the Metacuterebra, Roggenhofer, Sudicomitis, and the and other neotropical ball flies. So there are, uh, in the Arctic, there are about, there have, have this highest, so far the uh, most record of ball flies and then a 30 species, I suspect it can overtake the number of the Nearctic uh, um, um, species of ball flies. So again, Looking back, um, some of the interest group, even though this is suggested to be Nearctic, uh, one species that's only found in Baja, California, uh, Cuterebra bahensis. Um, we think that uh, there are uh, parasites of rabbit. Another member of uh, uh, Americana group uh, is only found in the northern part of Mexico. And another also members uh, extends from Mexico up to part of Nicaragua, perhaps uh, Belize and, and other parts of Central America that can extend to that. So it's kind of uh, odd for that grouping. And then the cuniculi, all the rabbit ball flies, only found, there's one species only found in Panama. So far I have seen any record from them. Um, another one is the Andinocuterebra. It's a monotypic genus, but I think there's another species that I found uh, is from originally described actually in the, uh, in the um, border of Col uh, Colombia and uh, Panama. And then they uh, can extend 
here in Mexico. Actually, I found a species here in, in our collection, one of the Andinocotribra. And then the Metacotribra one that's only found in Argentina. It's pretty unique. And then um, so far, we know some of the host records. And then most of the Neotropical, we, have, we don't have a clue. We don't know the host are. So these are the rodents, squirrels, rabbits, rabbits, and then some of the members, we don't know the hosts. And then uh, if you can see from here, they're uh, colorful, they're unique, the, pat the col color patterns are quite distinct for them. And here uh, are the example of Pseudocomitis. They have really a shiny callus on the head, and then they're really high kind of bristle-like, kind of look like a velvet ant or mutilids. And then this one, the Roggenhofer, a kind of triangular shape of head, and then the arista is really smooth. It's just straight. Unlike the other one, we have plumos. And then this is the Andinocotribra. This is a holotype from London. They don't have antenna. And then they have this really narrow face. It's pretty distinct for them. So the question is, how many genera? So uh, there was a recently described genus of ball flies from Iran back in 2017. Thomas Pape, my supervisor, published it and then tasted, tested it and then suggested this is a new genus. So what I did, to answer the question of how many genera, I used the morphological data, a morphological matrix, and added some characters and taxa to test whether it is. So this is the result that I've got. These are the uh, all American wildflies that I used. So I run an IQ tree, a maximum likelihood, 87 taxa using 124 morphological characters. So based on this, the uh, Pseudogametes, Andinocutorebra, and Rogenhofera, this is preliminary study, they are nested within Cuterebra. So that's the dermatobia, and then the rest is cuterebra, but the uh, other are nested within. So it suggests that um, there's no support to separate them. So there are so far, we know that's like two genera still. In a broad sense, cuterebra and then dermatobia. That was kind of um, uh, from that uh, initial run, from that matrix that I did. But it's pretty unique because the Andino cuterebra from Colombia and Costa Rica that I found, this one is from Mexico. They have very long antennas. It's pretty unique. You haven't seen that in, in most of the butterflies. Again, we don't know the host. So I'm trying to expand it and studying, continue studying the piparium and score some characters and see what goes on and you know continue to study them. So these are examples of other piparia of the butterflies. Now, the last part, the association of butterflies and some of the fat worms. I've seen this one during my visit last year, the Smithsonian. I've seen this. This is a rhino bot fly. It's only unique. They're a host of uh, Gyrostigma rhinocerontis. So I saw this you see, looking at the jar of a collection of bot flies, and I, this stood out. What's this? I think that doesn't look like a bot fly. So I looked at it, and I found some more. I found one attached to a platform, another one to attach another platform, and then I found three more. Another to a fluke, a tapeworm, and then a fluke. They're attached to it. So what's going on here? They are preserved there. So rhino ball flies are only found in Africa, particularly in sub-Saharan region. They look like pompilid bass, but they are ball flies, reduced mouth part, and they're specializing in uh, mammals, particularly rhinos. So what the female does is that they lay the eggs around the shoulder, around the neck, or sometimes around the horn. So when it hatches, it goes inside the a rhino and then stay and develop inside the stomach. So that's the uh, uh, rhino wildfire. So to give you an idea of what they look like, that's, it's just a different genus, but sm most of the larvae are attached to the walls of the stomachs. So the rhino wildflies are pretty much looks like the same. So I tried to trace where's the host. So this from Smithsonian, that's the, what, what a, rhino, a white rhino, their host looks like. And I tried to trace where the host original record and I found it, it's in an American museum. The hosts are the, uh, they're still preserved in the American Museum, but the uh, larvae are also by, in the Smithsonian. So they're in the different museums. And so I tried to identify that. It's a gastrodiscus that so far we've ended up so far using the keys and then the anoplocephala, you know, the gastrodiscus, the genus of the flatworms. So this genera, they belong to the Ocestos and the Genia, and then all of them are parasitic. So the question is, Parasites attached to another parasite, are they going on other other hyperparasites? Are the bot by hyperparasites? But again, in order to test this, we have to look at the morphology, uh, morphology, phylogeny, and then their association, whether there's a good evidence. Again, based on just specimens, we cannot conclude anything whether they're hyperparasites or not. Are there predators? There are some cases that parasites tend to be predatory. 
But again, that is limited. Those are, but those are interesting questions. Or could they be sim a defensive symbionts, meaning that they can facultatively switch whether an, uh, when another parasite is present, the symbiont can act as a, as a parasite or a, 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 a defense for the host. And when it's absent, it can it acts as like a parasite of the host. But the car uh, published in 1916, I saw this literature and I saw the specimen in American Museum, uh, the same specimen here, suggested that uh, they could be only just attachment. It's like a, a shock reaction response of the both flies when they were when the hosts are killed, so they kind of attach on whatever uh, uh, is there, so they kind of attach to it. So it could be just like a you know, just a, 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 a shock response when the a change in the physiology of the host. But it's interesting to note that all the um, rhinobot flies that I've seen, there are only early third instar larvae, no second instar, no late third instar that are attached to any um, of the parasitic uh, worms. So what I did, well, maybe we, I can figure out what the species is based on the structure of the, uh, the bot fly. So I did a raw um, CT scan, see, try to understand well, what's the structure and see there, I tried to uh, make some contrast, see the internal um, um, gut system, if they're still there. So I used this specimen, just to, so it's kind of raw, still, um, I'm still improving some of this, but uh, wait, hold on to this. Um, so see that some of the internal structures, but take note of this, if you know, I don't know if you've noticed it, this part, it looks like a terpanosome. It's a protozoa. So I tried to enhance it, see if I can make sense of it, uh, see the density of it, and um, look at the structure here. Kind of looks like terpanosome. terpanosome. It's inside the liver fluke. Uh, if I forgot to mention, this is a 1912 specimen. It's a 111 year old specimen. It's very old. I didn't stain it. I didn't do anything. I just scan it. So it's still there. It's amazing. And it's actually a surprise for us. So we found this. So now the question is, with this information, can we use the, the specimens to track all diseases? Tracking down um, um, from, the, from the collections that we have. It's important to preserve all the specimens that we use based on this finding alone. So with that, um, I'm just going to end it from the findings and then um, uh, thank my supervisor, Lynn Timsey, Thomas Pape, and some of my collaborators, Jeff Bettner, people from CDFA, Jose Pujolus, uh, Ziad Puri, Alan Ashworth gave me the apostles, Jeff Atardo from Davis, and then Jack Cheng from Berkeley, some of the grants I used, and also the other museums that uh, kind of supported and let me borrow their specimens to continue studying. So with that, I'll just conclude it. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. Thank you for your time and your attention. Tenemos tiempo para preguntas. Hi, a really nice talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, is there any um, Clades or groups that are parasiting other arthropods within the, the Americas. Oh, um, in the botflies? Yes. Uh, all of them are parasites of, uh, you mean whether they're hosted by arthropods? Yes. Uh, no, uh, sorry. Uh, they're, all, they're only specialized on mammals. Mm. Uh, mammals, marsupials, and, uh, and uh, we have some uh, rodents. Um, uh, surprisingly, the possum in North America, there are so far we haven't seen any record. I haven't encountered any records. And some of them can easily also some of them. Uh, botflies, they have a wide range. Uh, the human botflies have a wide range of mammalian hosts. But I think I mentioned to Omar a while ago that somebody gave uh, a specimen to me uh, found from a snake, a king snake mm -hmm. in Oklahoma, I think. And it's pretty like, why? what's a botfly doing in a snake, a king snake? 
but I think it's from a prey of the king snake, probably a rodent that kind of ended up in the stomach of the king snake. So that's what we think, because it's it's pretty. Uh, I mean, it could be an accident, accidental, yeah. you know, uh, myasis. I need to show you a couple of pictures I have from Scorpion. Okay, all right, I'll try. Thank you. Alguien más? Hello. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I got here late. Maybe I, I missed what I'm going to ask. So, have you uh, have you observed any kind of pattern in terms of um, um, my misses with bees in different regions of the world, depending on the phylogeny of your uh, flies? Because um, I mean, there are several several of these. Of course, look like bumblebees. Yes, and like other bees, but are th is there any, or are there any studies that correlate both things? The, you mean the mimicry, whether right. they're sympatric of, right. of, of, of bumblebees? Yeah. Uh, we actually submitted a new paper. We found a, a new bot fire for Ecuador is being under review. They very much look like orchid bees. Yeah, some exactly. Of them like, yeah, exactly. Some, of, some of the orchid bees, they look like uh, this one, uh, we think, and the share, um, but nobody really studied it. We just suggested that mm -hmm. it could be the model of the, some of the uh, mimicry of some of the botflies. But if you can see the well, uh, well, I, well, the, the photos of that, there are very good mimics of bumblebees. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yes. Thank you. But that's an that's an opportunity for future study here. If somebody wants to work on the mimicries of of botflies and you know and bumblebees and other curbuculate, there's so many things to study. So many things. Hi, thank you very much for, for your talk. I'm not completely sure if I under, understood correctly, but uh, one of the trees that you showed, I think it was based on morphological data. Yes. And I think you used a maximum likelihood yes. um, methodology to, to run morphological data. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I look at the branch lengths and I think it's kind of weird I don't know if you can put the tree again, yeah, yeah. please. Oh, uh, let's see. Oh, let's see. Yes. Yeah, there's some really long branch lengths. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. I was wondering about that because um, I think your in-group showed like very long branches. Yes, yeah. And what is going on there? Oh, that is that is actually a good question because especially for the uh, stomach ball fly, uh, for the stomach ball flies, this, the, the, the pretty... Uh, well, hold on. It's yeah. The, I've I've been looking at that. I think the most of the uh, they have a specialized characters. So I'm I'm just looking at some of the unique characters: the hair structures, the antennae, the legs, even the wing venation. Uh, hold on. Oh, I think there it is. Yeah. Uh, that okay. <laughs> so here you can see from this song call is really long. Even this one, uh, uh, Strobilo, Strobilo, yes, was, uh it kind of sticks out from this uh, clade of hyperdermatins. So um, it, it it also happens to some of the trees in in military data. We we haven't understood quite well, but again, I guess uh, the the character change seems to be stand out on the rest. It can accumulate throughout this branch. That's what we think. But uh, there's some, um, especially for the uh, larvae. Some of the spines are pretty unique. Uh, one of the uh, could be an anthropomorphic characters, but yeah. Uh, yeah, but what about the distribution of the data in your matrix? Because I'm wondering if you have a lot of missing data in the in the groups at the top of the tree, and then you have a lot of data in 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 both of the of the trees mm -hmm. in the in, in both of the branches with uh, branch lengths like kind of large uh i think on the top i used here california california and sarcophagid so uh, uh most of them are skewed i think towards the um characters on the ball flies and the parasitism and um i i think i remember some of the uh, branch support is pretty low here they're mm -hmm. pretty low uh about oh, i can't remember exactly probably around 60 percent or something or low but the accumulation of characters here is is right. Uh, it's actually fascinating. One thing is that uh, the this two genera that um, used to be uh, uh, belong to these uh, gastroflyans are kind of now in the hyperdermatin. 
So I think some of this suggests that some of the characters, particularly the larvae, is quite. Uh, in, uh, I, I wanted to look further into that that question on why there's such long branch length. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Well, and also, did you run parsimony? I did, yeah, I did, system. but I didn't show it. But yeah, it's kind of same topology, pretty much same kind of, but the branch lines are different. Yeah, for sure. Yes, yeah, so, but I just just want to show this a quick run. Okay. Uh, but yeah, that's a good point. Then uh, running your person. Yeah, Thank so, you yeah. very much. And uh, your things about flatworms and uh -huh. your organisms is amazing. It's it, it's uh, yeah, it's it. serendipity. It's just I just found it. That's again the beauty of looking go going back again to the collections. It's important, and you'll find more and more throughout the years. You know, uh, those are uh, as long as we have the physical evidence. We can the voucher specimens are very important. You'll find more and more of that. Yeah. So, what is your best guess about the relationship between the flatworm and and the butterfly larva? Uh, what would be your best guess or conclusion, is it the flatworm parasitizing the butterfly larva or because the shape of the flatworm is seems to be set or sort of designed to fit uh -huh. on oh, the okay. extreme of the larva. So, uh -huh. it, so it seems like this is not a, a coincidence. It's like, it's like a ev good fit, like a relationship through yeah. evolutionary time or something. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, uh, um, Alejandro uh, can give more about the parasites, but I think uh, from here, we this is so far the association is is pretty bizarre for them to attack another parasite, and there are no uh, biology that explains why would they attack them other than perhaps just a uh, physiological change. I asked some of the people in Smithsonian the parasite. Um, there are some cases with the change of physiology of the host when they die. Some of the intestinal parasites sometimes can end up behind the eye of their host. So there's some a huge migration within the body of their host. But for both flies, again, uh, it can be true, but it again, it's hard to test them. I mean, nobody can you know dissect <laughs> rhinos nowadays. It's a really, so it, it's it's really an interesting question, and it's still a problem. But again, it can be. I I was you know again, it's just a, probably just a shock. Uh, change in the environment. Is it attached to the anterior end of the larva or is it attached to the posterior end? Uh, if I can show the photos. Oh, always again. on the on the same side of the body of the larva? That's a good point because most of them I noticed that they're only attached, not only that the, the early third instar, but most of them are attached to the anterior half of the parasites, whether on the, the quiet head or just the medial anterior half. So why are they not on the, on the posterior end? No, yeah, that's a good point. I don't know what's going on there, but this patterns kind of suggest that there's must be going on there. I mean, but it's worth investigating, but again, it's important to document them and uh, write down these observations. Yeah, so I'm uh, sorry, I, I don't have a, a good direct answer for that, I, yeah. but it's an important question. Alimas? Bueno, entonces le agradecemos a, a Sócrates su presencia y los invitamos a tomar café para seguir platicando con el ponente. Muchas gracias. Oh, thank you, thank you.